Steve, tell me about the, the work that you've done in the past and the work that you do now. Yeah, I mean, always trying to be some kind of writer. I guess that's the through theme to it all. And I've tried a lot of different ways when we were, we, I say me and my brother when we were younger, uh, we, we wanted to be filmmakers. And that was the kind of writing I thought about when we were in school, not so much the type of writing that you do in school. But, uh, you know, so we made lots of little movies and comedy sketches that we filmed. And through our 20s, we tried to make movies and had some success and some failure at it. And, and through a winding path that led me to, of all things, textbook writing, history textbook writing, which I'm forever apologizing for because I hate those books and kids hate them. And, and uh, they're just very boring for a lot of reasons we don't need to, to go into. But it was, th that was my 10,000 hours, you know, that idea about how, how long you have to practice something to get good at it. And it really was one of those kind of blessing in disguise type of things because I practiced writing every day. And for the first time, I really got into the idea of writing nonfiction, especially history, because I saw how it was being written for, for young people. And I'm talking like upper elementary, middle school, into high school ages. And, but how it could be done too, that the fact that there, these stories were actually not boring, as I thought they were when I was in middle school, but actually very exciting and interesting and thought provoking. And that the material was there, everything, every element that you need for a great story was there. And, and so I'm, I'm saying as though it happened overnight, it didn't, but I eventually came up with the idea of taking this material that I had learned in, in my textbook researches and trying to write books on history that people would find more enjoyable to read, but would still get across all this information that we want everyone to know. You know, you, you t I know that you didn't want to keep going into the dry textbooks, but I have yeah. to know, in your opinion, I mean, you talked about memorizing dates, but what do you think is so uninspiring about traditional history textbooks? And what makes a story more interesting or inspiring, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, the boring part of textbooks, and it's not exclusive to history, is if it's just memorization. And, and there's sort of a, the history is the worst of that because it's just the kind of thing that, that adults, if, if you corner them, they'll have to admit they don't actually know either, you know, when this or that battle took place or what this explorer, what river this explorer went on. And, and so it's actually not super important. Um, so you have to get away from that and turn it, you know, like we've been saying, into a story. So the elements of a good story are the same, whether it's in fiction or in film or a TV series, or a comic book. And you can bring those into nonfiction with great characters, great dilemmas for those characters, challenges and ideas and bring all that in and, and wrap it up into a great plot. And if you become a history nerd and embrace it like I have, then, then you have these, these ready-made plots that, that have everything you could ever want. That everything, if you take a screenwriting class that tells you, remember to put in conflict and have different things happen in each act of the story and all that naturally and happens in, yeah. in, in stories so well. And so it's fun to find those and then figure out the puzzle of how to, how to tell it while yeah. keeping it totally true. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about when I think about history and history textbooks too, Steve, I think about um, this issue of truth. You mm -hmm. did talk about how um, certain moral dilemmas come up when you write history, um, but even the very nature of writing about history really deals with the issue of truth. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, the internet is now rife with misinformation about historical figures and events. Um, I've seen people mistakenly or intentionally misquote a, a, a historical figure in order to push an agenda or maybe like promote really kind of extreme views on certain issues. I'm wondering, you know, what advice do you have for Americans who want to understand the truth about our nation's history? And, and more largely, what can writing and reading history do for us on a larger level? Well, that's a really big Really big question, but yeah, it can do it. It's so important to do and to, to know history. I think so much of what we're struggling with now would at least be a little bit clearer if we knew history. Uh, they take Black Lives Matter, for instance. Um, it, our, and then you go back to the moral dilemmas. There's no deeper moral dilemma in our country than, than racism and the fact that most of the founders 
we're slave owners. And so that's kind of sewn into us. And so, so if you know that, even just that basic thing that, that our first president, the man who wrote the Declaration of Independence, the man who said, give me liberty or give me death, and so on down the line, we're all slave owners, then you wouldn't have to explain why we need to say Black Lives Matter because you would just know, you would understand it. It wouldn't be political, it would just be logical. So that's, that's really why we need to know this stuff. And so we don't end up arguing about facts. That's a very strange thing. And I, I guess people always think in their time, there's something unique about their time. And maybe people have always struggled with this, but it seems like we've let it get too far where, where facts are now things that we get to argue about. Yeah. Well, um, Steve, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, an upcoming project that you have? Do you have any um, books currently kind of cooking in the oven, or is there anything that you've recently published um, that you think would be worth sharing? I always have many things in the oven, and as you say, uh, many projects. So I'm kind of almost lucky. I don't have anything coming out this year. So many writers do, and they were either delayed or, of course, they're just much harder to to promote and talk about so much of what I do is to go into schools, which obviously is not going to be happening anytime soon, other than in this kind of format. And so, but I do have stuff in the works. So next year I'll have a new nonfiction book. And uh, probably the book that, that I'm, that's best known of mine is a book called Bomb, a World War II story about the scientists who made the atomic bomb, but it's also kind of a spy thriller, the spies who stole secrets of the bomb, and that's exactly what I'm trying to do in a nutshell. It's kind of like this page-turning nonfiction thriller. And so I'm kind of doing a follow-up on that story. It's going to be called Fallout, about the Cold War, kind of taking the story of the arms race and spying into, into the Cold War. And so that's going to be my next nonfiction book, which will be next, it's still a year from now. And then the thing that I'm talking about that I'm working on for the 1850s is actually a graphic novel, which I love. I love comics. And I love reading them. I like to draw, but, I, but this is something that I would write and that a much better artist actually draw. And it's a, you know, what I was saying, the story of American politics in the 1850s leading up to the Civil War. So that's writing, that's really going full circle because that's writing, writing a comic is really almost not different at all from writing a screenplay. And you're imagining everything that you're seeing and hearing and just writing it down. And instead of filming it, you're handing it off to an illustrator to, to draw it. So, those are the two projects I'm working on, but I'm always thinking, you know, what's next, what's next? That's part of the fun of this job is to, to skip around, to, to try yeah. a lot of different things. 